Thank you, folks. Folks, we are honored to have you tonight. I'll start with the star, Sasan Gabai, please. <laughs> Thank you. We also have the director here, <laughs> Moshe Rosenthal, please welcome. Fabulous job, unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you, thank you both. Thank you all thank for you. being a part of this. Um, and thank you for being here. Moshe, maybe let's start from the beginning. Where, where did this come from? Um, obviously not my own life. Um, but yeah, um, um, I guess like um, my parents uh, mostly. Um, my parents are probably the same age of the characters. And uh, I don't know, I guess I've been um, watching them for many years and observing them. And um, I think I realized that there was a certain point where they were, um, you know, at a certain age, I guess like about to retire. And, uh, and I noticed that there's this kind of like weird uh, feeling of uh, regret, but also hope that things that might gonna like be different soon in a new phase of their lives. And I felt that, um, you know, that I recognized that feeling and it reminded me a lot of um, of high school and of, um, you know, like my own experiences as a teenager when you're about to become an adult. Um, so yeah, so I thought that it would be maybe interesting experiment to kind of like tell a coming of age story that is mostly based on my own experiences, but through the perspective of, of my parents or their generation. Um, yeah, and, uh, and by that, you know, having the, the, the possibility to ask question like, questions like, uh, can we ever, you know, change later in life? Can um, a 50-year-old relationship allow you to um, rebel? Um, yeah, so, so, uh, so that's how it started, probably, yeah. I, I love that because I mean the film has such a unique tone, and I, I give you so much credit for really in today's world to find a unique tone is really rare. And to really, I mean, I, when you told me when you you you've mentioned it to me of this like it falling into the genre of high school and falling into that those kind of films and suddenly seeing that oh yeah these are high school relationships they're all a bunch they, they're in their sixties but they're acting like a bunch of teenagers, um, it, yeah, it, which I guess like aren't we all at some way, you know? And, and it, it turns out we might be. We might be. Um, Sasa, let me ask you, how was uh, the character of Mayer, how, how, did you, how did you approach Mayer? How did you get into that? What was he to you? I, I was first, uh, I was attracted to the, to the script. Uh, I mean, I, I didn't pass through what uh, Moshe had in, in mind uh, in his relationship in, uh, with, with his parents or, or, or his childhood memories or, or youth memory. Uh, I just look at the script and I look at the character and I thought, uh, what can I, uh, what can I do with it? And uh, I was, I've been uh, very much attracted to the script because I, I realized that my character, all the characters, as a matter of fact, uh, um, there's a kind of space between the written uh, uh, script and uh, what you can feel in this space. And I, I felt like uh, there is this, this gap. That, that it's, it's my job to to uh, to fill, and uh, that was my main attraction: uh, the space between the written world and the the and the character that you have to 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 make a, a living one. And, and you do a fabulous job with that. It's so. Thank it's you. so. There's. It's all those moments. <laughs> I mean, the moments where you're speaking, there's, there's, there's great dramatic. It's those moments actually in between that I feel is like uh, captured. And I guess you both of your work together. I mean, I, I don't even know where to start with the, the, the scene of the, of the headshots. But like, you know, to, to really <laughs> capture those moments, it's true art. I mean, uh, this is poetry there. Moshe, it was, uh, this scene was very short. I think we did it in one take. Uh, am I right? I don't, don't know. Um, I think, well. First of all, this is, I think, the, the, the audition scene is probably the only scene that was improvised in a way. So I think a lot of the credit goes to th this man <laughs> because um, it's really... <laughs> um, 
And yeah, we had like, I think it was like an hour of just like playing with the situation and, um, and then, you know, uh, editing that specific scene, I remember like, it was just too many good things. <laughs> Um, and, and there was something so, and, and I think that's something that, you know, it shows like in different parts of the film, but there's this kind of like strange combination and, and it's also a tonal combination, but it's also something that Sasson brings that it could be, uh, extremely, uh, like fragile and vulnerable and at the same time, um, just, um, passionate passionate and also funny and also sad and there's this uh, you know I, I think we always try to capture to capture something that will that will not allow you to feel only one thing but will have a uh, different tonal contradiction in it and Sasson does it so good it's about uh, it's a bit a uh, kind of a ironic uh, approach and and then take of our of, of our profession you know sometimes uh, that the pretend to be at it, you are pretending to be something and you are so in, so deep in it and at the same time you are outside in it so it's kind of a, a, a take of uh, of our of our metier i got also so that, that i didn't know that that scene would be uh, like funny i thought it would might be like cute because you are cute uh <laughs> sorry um, i'm more than cute I man <laughs> Anyway, but but I think watching it for the first time with an audience, I think it was like the biggest laugh. And then I realized that there's something, um, you know, that people are laughing because it's also funny, but also almost as a um, um, like protection mechanism because it's also kind of like uh, cringy and dark and sad. Yeah. Yeah, because uh, there is innocence uh, at the end of the scene because mm -hmm. he's doing things, and then at the end he say. Is it okay? <laughs> and and so, uh, so the, th this gap between uh, him going inside the, the situation and and, uh, and and criticize it at the same time, this is the, I think, the funny thing. Yeah, and, and it's, just, it's these beautiful moments of like, you're pretending to pretend as an actor. You have to like, you know, um, I, because the audience is feeling that you are pretending even though you're acting as a person, it's very meta, and uh, we, we we found ourselves. I think the after Tribeca Film Festival. Sorry for mentioning Tribeca here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I think the day after they took uh, um, snapshots of, of us, and, and we found ourselves in the same situation as in the <laughs> film. There, there's a lot of pretending at Tribeca. Um, <laughs> no offense. <to laughs> um, let's. Uh, Let's, let's talk about the uh, social criticism of uh, the film a little bit. I actually, I, one of the things that I find fascinating about the film is, I, I mentioned this earlier, is you're capturing a real moment of Israel, which we showed a film here a couple of years ago about uh, Petah Tikva, about the town of Petah Tikva, and about its history, and how it used to be, it was a documentary, and it, it used to be this like small little um, uh, suburb of Tel Aviv. Um, and now, if you look at it today, it's all these... Uh, Faux fancy high rises and um, and and this is what Israel has become in many ways and all these places outside of Tel Aviv. Sure, there's plenty of high rises in Tel Aviv, but places like Batyam, where this takes place, um, have Hulon, Hulon. Um, they they have these. Uh, they, they, they it's this new world of what Israel is, and I think it's in some ways a little bit of a metaphor of where Israeli society is. Um, what are your What are your thoughts there on this uh, on this world that you're capturing? Yeah, I mean, uh, you said that it's like um, a social like uh, criticism, which um, I find it really hard to kind of like um, feel like I had like a, a specific intention, except just to observe this world because it felt that it's so clearly, um, you know, different than what you may think about when you think about Israel, and and this is actually the modern uh, suburbs, um, and it's. In every city, it looks kind of the same. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I, I guess it started for me, like my parents actually live in the same neighborhood that we shot the film. So it started for me f uh, from like uh, just a feeling. I remember remember standing in the balcony, just like uh, Meir uh, is standing in the balcony and feeling this, I don't know, just like feeling of loneliness. This like very uh, strange loneliness that you know, on the one hand, you you, you live with so many people, like uh, I, I'm guessing, like like-minded people in the same buildings, but at the same time, it feels pretty um, 
they feel pretty detached from each other. So there's a strong sense of loneliness. And I just, I, I thought it was like, um, you know, we have the American suburbs, we know kind of like the ideals and the values of that and, and kind of like how, you know, the American dreams didn't really, um, you know, deliver. So or we know its flaws, the flaws. And I thought it would be very interesting to do the same uh, exploration to the Israeli suburbs that looks completely different. Um, and yeah, and you know, it's it's high rises buildings uh, look the same, have like the same kind of like feeling of, um, I guess like s different symbols of wealth, which are usually kind of like, um, you know, it says something about the society and about us kind of like living in a place that um, aspire to be wealthy, and and you know, and everyone there are just middle class, and there's something kind of like. I guess tragic in in a lot of middle class people, um, you know, parading like fake wealth everywhere. So if it's the car or the chandelier, or um, and also I guess there's something about the way that these high rises are built that you know there's no way you can avoid the feeling of um, um, inferiority when you're living downstairs from other people. <laughs> So that idea of like uh, that person, the myth of the someone living in the penthouse felt kind of like, um, uh, I guess like a larger than life uh, metaphor, but at the same time kind of like silly. I mean, because the gap between their salary is not that big, but there is a gap, you know? Um, and yeah, and, and I felt um, very strongly about just exploring those nuances. A and to just, I'm a spoon feed it completely. I think that's a theory of karaoke, in in yeah. some ways. And yeah. uh, maybe maybe you could say why like, why did you cho choose to call the film karaoke, and what part does karaoke play to you in, in all of us? Uh, uh, good and difficult questions. <laughs> um, yeah, I think I I think uh, under the same kind of like theme of playing with the ideas of of what seems to be like um, you know the idea of wealth and success and the um, kind of like mediocrity of life uh, and that gap between dreams and 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 day-to-day -day reality karaoke felt like the right metaphor to um, you know to, to give the audience something that on the one hand is completely um, just like fake and and also kind of silly but at the same time you know explore the the themes of authenticity through it and in a weird way, kind of like try to find in those fake cheap chandeliers and in those like bad version of karaoke song, uh, something that is actually authentic and something that is actually beautiful. And um, yeah, and I, I, I guess like the irony of it m made, made it work out and made sense out of it. I mean, I, I remember trying to explain to people that scene where they go to the coffee shop and they go through the lobby and 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 everybody thought that it's going to be like a scene that would kind of like show how pathetic the situation is and i thought that it would be much interesting to to glamorize it in a way that would be so like over the top and so um that even though we know that there's like an ironic look about it and that this situation is kind of silly because they're just going to the coffee shop downstairs we would also be completely immersed and completely invested in that feeling. Um, and we would, you know, we would feel like they are going to the whatever ball or, or the biggest party in the world. Um, yeah, anyway, I can, I can just keep talk talking. Uh, good, 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 good. Um, Sasson, the karaoke moments, of course, in the film. Um, uh, um, how, how was that uh, something that, uh, first of all, um, how did you choose the songs, and uh, how did you prepare? I mean, also, it was such a unique moment in terms of how that's not karaoke that I've ever heard before. And, <laughs> and to do it for an Avi Toledano song in kind of the... Um, uh, we were looking for, uh, there was two options, uh, Avi Toledano's song and the uh, Boss Sharabi's song. N another good, yeah. Yeah, and uh, we, we choose something that w will be related to this person. I mean, there's, you don't have to be very musically, musically sophisticated uh, to know it. So it's quite popular. And uh, so this is the, I think, the, the main choice of, of uh, Moshe. And also, you've done it like much better. 
Like, y yeah. What, the, the, the Avi? The Avi Tordano, yeah. It, it we try both of them. Uh, <laughs> and then we work on it, and um, we were happy with the, with the Toledano version. We, we were working on it uh, throughout COVID, so uh, we never like had a chance to be together in the room and sing. So we used to record um, him singing the different songs uh, on Zoom, and, and he would like sit and sing in front of me, and I would be like, I can't believe <laughs> that I'm sitting you know, in front of a screen and watching Sasson Gabay sing to me. <laughs> I'm like listening, and every once in a while, uh, his wife or, or one of his kids will pass by and, and take a look at him like singing. Yeah. <laughs> Why are you singing these strange songs? Um, for those not familiar, it's kind of like a very much an offbeat, I would say, not to in the mainstream of Israeli. And these are songs that you would never find on a karaoke list anywhere. It's, it's pretty clear, ev even in... Well, I mean, the Cat Stevens one, um, you, you would. I mean, I know because everybody... Every karaoke party I've been in since the film, everybody puts the song and asks me to <laughs> sing it. So I've done a few versions of it. You should be very proud. This is the first film festival showing this film. It's not having a karaoke party Thank afterwards. Thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. We, we put the kibosh on that. Um, I'd love to take some uh, questions from the audience. I could go on here all night, but uh, I'd love to make you a part of this conversation too. Don't be shy. Um, I, I will. Um, no, we got a question. We'll jump right in. I love the movie, and it got better and better. I thought some of the uh, scenes were so locally Israeli, in particular, the Mishtaha, when they, the <laughs> they came <laughs> and they left. No comment on the Mishtaha, I highly respect them. But it was funny, I, I really felt uh, the compliment of being an Israeli when I watched that scene. So thank you. I wanted to ask about the crocodiles on the shoes. Sure. Did you have some significance for it? And the whole scene was like flooding his hand and so violent in a way. Yeah. And one more thing I want to put in the mix is that this, your song was so beautiful and so moving. It was the exposure of the full character, I felt. Definitely, yeah. Um, so the crocodiles. <laughs> the, the important stuff. Let's uh, get yeah. to the, sorry, yeah. I, I didn't bring up the crocodiles. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's actually like uh, I, it, uh, um, my mother had th those shoes. <laughs> um, and, you know, every th almost everything that uh, Tova's character is wearing um, is from my mother's closet. Um, and uh, and the crocodile shoes. It's it's funny because I I remember those like I remember seeing those shoes like once, and I was like, what? And I asked my mother, what are those shoes? And she's like, those are my crocodile shoes. And she was so proud. And I was like, oh, that's fascinating. And then uh, yeah, and then I asked her to use the crocodile shoes, and then I ruined the crocodile, or he ruined the crocodile shoes. Uh, yeah, but I, I just felt that it's a, it's a beautiful, um, also goes back to the same theme of, um, of this very glamorous um, thing, sitting dusty in the closet, and the idea of her kind of like waiting for that right moment to, to take it out felt very uh, touching to me. Um, and yeah, and I mean, I don't have it on me, but um, throughout at least the first, the initial festival, I used to take the the crocodile and put it on my uh, jacket, uh, which made my mom very proud. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, but go going back to your comment as far as it being very Israeli, there's something also fabulous about this film that it is so universal. It's so of our time, and this is not a phenomenon only in Israel. Um, and there's, in some ways, nothing, so like, is this a Jewish film in any way? Is there anything specifically that you would say are related? It's not, it doesn't have the classic Israeli politics in it. I, I, I didn't hear any Arabic. I didn't hear, and yet it is so specifically Israeli in so many ways. And, um, and, and I think, uh, I think that's, uh, that's part of, uh, of its success, speaking universally, but also being very authentic um, with, its, with, its, uh, with who it's, uh, with its place. We have a question yeah. here. Um, this comment is addressed to Sasson. Um, you know, it was really a phenomena because when you were being 
berated by your wife, and when you were walking around the apartment of uh, Itzik and feeling less than, I swear you became smaller. It looked as if physically you were shrinking up into yourself. And what an amazing ability you have to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I, th I think the, the, the character is going through um, many stages and uh, he's, uh, I, I, it's maybe it's literally speaking, but he's going from a phase of somebody who observe life into somebody who's participating life. Uh, and, um, and he went through, through all this journey. And uh, on the way, I, I had, uh, myself, I mean, I had to, uh, to give up any uh, inhibitions and any uh, protections and uh, just to put myself in the situation and at the moment. And uh, um, sometimes it's embarrassing m for me even to, to look at it, uh, how uh, e e the, 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 the size of the exposure that uh, I went through. Uh, but thank you. We have a question up here. I want to know how your parents Please. reacted to this, to see parts of themselves in this film. Um, a familiar question, I must <laughs> say. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it, it's funny because on the one hand, I, I did grow up in a very supportive house. And as you can tell, like, my mother is the kind of person who would say, oh, make a film about me, make a film about us. <laughs> and I would be like, no, no. Um, <laughs> um, but yeah, I think I, the process of writing the film uh, at, at the beginning felt, I felt pretty confident, but at some point I realized that maybe I'm, you know, maybe that's not the film that they want me to make about them. So it's, it's hard. I, I, I had I had to go through a lot with um, just like just fearing that um, it wouldn't have the right uh, outcome, but at the same time, just you know knowing that I do it out of love for them, so like feeling kind of safe by that uh, sentiment. Um, but yeah, they saw the film. Like I I waited for the Jerusalem Film Festival for them to see it because. You know, usually, and uh, apparently, I'm not the only filmmaker uh, who, who does that with showing his projects to his uh, family, because the moment that you have like the audience and like uh, celebrities and people taking pictures, then there's an actual chance that you know their um, pride uh, of me uh, will overcome their embarrassment. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, so um, the the. the after the film, I, I went outside to to find them and to talk to them, and uh, I couldn't uh, I couldn't find them anywhere. And then there's like this area outside of the of the Jerusalem uh, Cinematheque, and there was this like a group of people standing in a circle and cheering. And I went to see what's going on, and my uh, mother was dancing Greek <laughs> music to them. Yeah, and like somebody was holding like uh, music from his iPhone, like some Greek music, and she was dancing. So I was, I, I was like, I think I'm, I think I'm fine. I think it's good. <laughs> yeah. But I must say that there's something. I, I think that for them, like if I'm um, being serious about it, I think for them to see it in an audience with a lot of people that react uh, to the film, I think that even if they saw themselves in the m in their most, you know, naked selves, I think uh, they realize that everybody there are have experienced things as, and, and, and they made me realize that I was thinking that I'm doing something personal, but I'm actually doing something completely universal. And, and, and yeah, and my father was like, that's not only us, that's everybody. And I was like, okay, good. <laughs> and, and I have to say, this is a moment to remind you that that can't be done on Netflix. This is one of those movies that people need to see together and really appreciate. I, I can't even imagine how this would play if you're watching it alone on a, on, a, on a screen. And it's really about this experience of people connecting over this film, which is like, you know, so nonspecific and manages to connect so many different people. We'll take uh, one last question. Let's see. Hi. Hello. Um, how are you? Good, good how are to you? See you? Good to see you. It's been a minute. Um, 
one moment and kind of specific line that stood out to me was towards the beginning when they went up to the penthouse for the first time. Um, and there's the line about the lighting, like, oh, the lighting is so cool. But I kind of thought that through the whole movie, that, you know, these buildings may be popping up everywhere and maybe kind of mundane and every day, but every shot, lighting and cinematography looks so beautiful, tracking from interior to out to the balconies, lights in the background of different colors. So I was wondering if you could talk about taking these kind of everyday locations that are popping up everywhere, but making them look so cinematic and visually interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's there's different parts to that because on the one hand, those um, neighborhoods, even though they look, you know, generic, they are lit like very wildly, which I felt to me like uh, it almost shows kind of like this strange identity crisis that, you know, um, they try to make everything very beautiful. So it's very colorful, but it all looks a bit too much. Um, but also I think that there was just something about like wanting to make a, s a film that is, uh, you know, just like a celebration of, of cinema and a celebration of life uh, that made us really, um, you know, want things to pop up, out. And there was something very easy um, in, I guess, like in, in, in what the film is about, the idea of, of, of Meir and Tova m moving out from their like, um, apartment that has like very kind of like flat um, palette to Itzik's world who is uh, full with like very rich color of gold and blue um, and it's you know and we try to kind of like portray it in a way that we you would notice that that color and that kind of like um, um, glamorized lifestyle slowly uh, you know uh, comes into their lives, so at some point, you know, their lives becomes a little bit gold and a little, a little bit blue. Um, you know, so, so we try to have fun with it as much as possible and remember that, you know, it's just like people paying for the ticket and you better have like a good looking film, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a beautiful production, I have to say, and it really like looks like, like uh, and I know Israeli productions happen for a lot less than American productions, and it looks on universal quality. And I think you should tell them how many days we shot. No, mm -hmm. I don't want you to feel sorry for us. Um, <laughs> All right, so forget it. No, just, it, just share the budget. Very just uh, no, we, we, we shot it like in um, two weeks, like very, very short, yeah, very tight schedule. Um, well, I I something about it worked and uh, <laughs> made it all Hopefully. come together. Thank you so much. Sasson, it's, it's such an honor. Thank you so much. What a beautiful job. Thank you. Thank what's, you. Ne what's next for you, Sasson? Um, what's next? Um, right now I'm uh, in doing the third season of Tehran. Uh, we are shooting in Athens. And in between, I, uh, I've shot a, a, a new Israeli film with Shemi Zarkhin who was our opening night film. Uh, Moshe, what's next for you? Um, I'm working on um, a new project, also um, uh, set in uh, Holon, only 30 years, um, uh, like in yeah. late 80s. Um, but yeah, um, also kind of personal, also very um, musical. So um, yeah, hope it will be great. We look forward to it. Thank you both. Thank you, Isaac. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you folks.